Welcome Pro Start Culinary students. So this is chapter number 13. I'm Chef Hawks and we are going through kitchen basics. Where do we get started? So let's start at how we build out a kitchen. So we generally in kitchens have work areas that are dedicated to specific tasks that occur in that area of the kitchen. It helps to keep the kitchen running nice and smoothly by separating all these tasks out and having specific equipment for those areas. So we have a different number of workstations, um, and this can depend upon the space that you have in that kitchen to actually make all of these systems work, and on the budget that you have to spend on all the equipment that it's gonna take uh, to flesh out that kitchen. So the workstations are grouped with similar equipment. The good kitchen design should maximize the flow of goods and staff going through and making it a very efficient place to be able to work. It also, also should be vitally important that every piece of equipment, everything is positioned to encourage as much food safety as possible and to reduce any preparation and service time that will be involved. Let's run through some of the sections that we have in our kitchen. So the hot food section, that's where we would generally have a broiler station, a fry station, a griddle station, saute and sauce station, and a holding station as well. The garde manger station is where we have salad preparation, cold food preparation, sandwich station, and a showpiece presentation, preparation and presentations as well. This is the cold kitchen, the, it's garde manger. Everything in it revolves around this kitchen in the classes. We cooked, warm, finished, cold, served, cold. We have five weeks that builds up to a grand buffet. We have one day left before the buffet, so now it's crunch time. I'm learning new things every day, like what not to do, what to do how to push my own envelope just a little bit more. Definitely new song. The atmosphere's in a real, real, real kitchen because that urgency or sense of urgency. You got a house where you got to move, you got to get it done. We're working all as a team. Same on the lines, we're in a steamer. Good. And when we were in a hotel kitchen or on a cruise ship, this is exactly how it would be. You can take, you know, something so simple as, you know, a piece of produce and turn it into art. Wayne cuts, I suggest using a paring knife. It'd be a nice paring cut. It's very good, very good. 
you know, he, he comes around and he's, he's great. You know, he helps us on anything we need. We, you know, we ask him a question and he, he goes out of his way. But that's the same shape as that strainer. He push it right through. You open up avenues for cruise ships, catering. On pro- off premise, off premise, or uh, corporate environment. Like vegetables and fruits, I never thought, oh, I can make a flower. <laughs> I can make a little bouquet. It's not just a piece of ground meat set on some that's a hamburger. Anybody can do that. Done properly, it is a thing of beauty. And that's really the only way you really can learn is doing it. Usually, what happens is when they first come into class, the first week, chef, I can barely write my name. And I said, well, we're going to find something for you. Trust me, we will. And this is what they do. The bakery section is all about having a mixing station, a dough holding and proofing station, a dough rolling and forming, baking and cooling, finishing cake decorating, um, and then uh, dessert preparation, frozen dessert preparation, and plating desserts as well. The banquet section is generally a simplified area, and this is because you're producing significant volumes of food that are all the same. And so in the banquet section, you're generally going to have the ability to do steam cooking and then dry heat cooking, things like roasting and broiling. I've been here 20 years. I love what I do. We do fresh food. I love to eat. Hi, I'm Jeff Kay. We're at Orange County Convention Center, and uh, I'm the executive chef for Center Plate. Right this way. We distribute from four different areas. The hot food, the cold food, the bakery, and if you see, everything is staged, ready to go. Everything is broken into different pub areas. There's a lot of food that we're cooking for 10,000 people. But I love working with the food. And a lot of things chefs don't do is they make the food here, and then it's done. We follow the food all the way out to the client. In the sense of, of the holding, the service, and the final presentation with the dessert, we go all the way through it. I don't just send it out and say that's it. Every day, every day is different. I haven't had the same day twice in 20 years. The big thing about doing this much food is, is the people. It's the people making the food. It's the people serving the food. If I don't have Danny in the front of the house, and I don't have the support from all the cooks, I can't do my job. I can't. But I mean, we're, you know, every day we go up, down, up, 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 up down, up, down, up. It's, it's, a, it's a roller coaster of, um, of feeling because if you really care, you know, you could walk, you could, you could walk out of the uh, kitchen at the end of the day and feel like a million dollars. You know, when you really nail it, we strive to nail it every day. And 99% of the time, I walk out of here feeling great. And now on to the mastery of short of the short order section. This can be sometimes seen as uh, by some people as just being the low end of the market, but some of these people are absolute masters at what they do, and it takes an awful lot to be able to master this. So this is all about having holding and plating, griddle station, fry station, and broiler station.
Now we move on to the front of house where we'd have a beverage station. And so that beverage station would have uh, its equipment set up to be able to do hot beverages, cold beverages, and alcoholic beverages too. So the way that we get all of these efficiencies, the way that we are able to actually serve a lot of people with a lot of different types of products uh, from food and beverage sides is where we have a brigade system set up. So the system of staffing a kitchen is called a brigade system. And so each worker is assigned a specific task or set of tasks. And they're related by different cooking methods, equipment, or types of food that's being produced in the kitchen. So the executive chef is responsible for all the kitchen's operations. The sous chef is the second chef, second in command. They generally would work on the schedules for all of the personnel in the kitchen. And then they cover uh, various different chefs or chefs work um, or station chefs works, uh, depending on what needs to be taken care of. If someone is off sick, someone has a, uh, has a uh, vacation day or anything like that, they would be able to move around to any other part of that kitchen. They're the one that will accept the order coming in from the front of house and they relay the order to the stations, letting them know exactly what's coming through so that that way they can make sure as the food is, uh, is brought up by each of those sections, they can review those dishes, make sure they are of the quality that's being looked for in order for them to be given to service to be taken out into the dining room. So now let's take a look at each specific station. So this is where you would have a station chef or a chef de partie. Uh, the chef de partie is in charge of that station um, and they will be in charge of producing specific menu items that fall under their section. And so they're supervised by the chef, the executive chef or the sous chef, and they're assigned specific tasks to work on with their team. So based on the certain cooking methods, equipment, or the item category which they cook in for their section. And this includes line cooks too. A pastry chef is the individual um, or the person who's in charge of that station where they will be producing baked goods, desserts, pastries. And this is separate generally from the regular kitchen. Um, this is normally off, uh, offset quite often. It may even be in its own separate facility um, as they produce lots of different kinds of products, some which require uh, lots of chilling and some which require just room temperature, but, uh, but maintain that room temperature. Then you have an expediter. So an expediter is an individual who would be communicating the orders that come in from the kitchen and go uh, from the front of house and go to the chefs in uh, in the kitchen, um, and they checks them and they check that the food is cooked correctly on that order before it's sent out to the wait staff. The wait staff serves food uh, warm and ready once the expediter hands it over to them. Sometimes that expediter position would be taken care of by that sous chef, the second chef. Sometimes even by the executive chef too. Let me show you exactly how this kitchen brigade setup will generally work. And this is a very broad spectrum type of one, but this gives a good idea for you. So up at the top here, we have our executive chef. He or she is overall in charge of everything that, uh, that occurs in that kitchen. Directly below, we have our sous chef. He or she, as we mentioned, will generally be taking care of the scheduling for all of the rest of the kitchen. Um, and they're second in charge. They're the one that will step in if the executive chef is off or away or incapacitated in any kind of way. They're the one that's ready to be able to step in. We also have a relief chef or chef torn on. Um, the relief chef is an individual who's actually trained and able to work in every section in the kitchen so they can step in at any given time. So then let's take a look at our chef de partie. So our chef de partie or our station chefs, these come under different categories depending upon what they're making. And sometimes some of these are merged together depending on how big that kitchen is and uh, how much space they have and equipment that they have to be able to separate these things out. But this would be for a very large hotel, a very large restaurant. So you have the saucier, who is the sauce chef. They have commie chefs, directly underneath, commissary chefs, who work directly below them, um, working, and these individuals, uh, as you can see all the way along the line, 
are individuals who are junior uh, to our chef de parties. Commie chef is generally there. They've been trained somewhat in their section, but they're still working on figuring out exactly which section they want to specialize in. Um, so they're learning from their chef de party um, on their section, and they may end up moving around to other areas too. Then we have the assistants. Uh, these individuals are fresh into the organization. They're looking to uh, have an opportunity, a chance at trying to make it as a chef, um, learning all the different things that they need to in that particular section at that particular time. So then we move across. We have a fish chef, which, uh, which is a poissonnier. Poisson is fish in French. And then we have the entremetier, which is the vegetable chef. The rotisseur, which is the roast chef for roasting meats. And then the pantry chef, or the garde manger. These are the uh, cold areas, so salads, sandwiches, those types of things. The griardin, which is the grill chef. And then the pâtissier, which is the pastry chef. As you can see, this individual on each section is in charge of their section, and they will lead their team below them to make sure that they get everything that they need to in their section. Let's see how this works in action. Escoffier knew that however good the food, a restaurant's reputation for excellence relied on consistency. To guarantee a room full of individual diners could get what they want, when they wanted, he created a whole new way of organizing the professional kitchen, the brigade system. I've come to Windows and Park Lane to see it in action. Expectations as a diner in a place like this are always very, very high. If we look at a menu and we can see there's a lovely choice, different items here take different times to prepare. But we expect the food to arrive at the table at the same time, regardless of what we order. They come to the table because there is a system in place, and that system is down to Escoffier. Beef, would you like that medium, medium rare? No, I would rare. Rare? Very nice. And this up is how that is Very nice. To show how Escoffier's brigade system still works today, I'm going to follow a single order from a waiter's pad to finished plate. So Andrew has taken the order and he is now putting it through to the kitchen the modern way, not by hand and pencil. That order is going to go straight through to the kitchen and the chef will call it out to his brigade. Okay guys, tomorrow two covers with scallops and salmon, both starters, and sauce, tomorrow, and this medium one head. The kitchen is split up into different teams. We've got cold starters there fish section here, meat section, garnish over there, and the pastry in the corner. And of course, head chef on the pass. He's organizing everything. Every section has somebody who's in charge, and that person is called a chef de partie, and then a commie, and then under that, maybe an apprentice. And every person has a responsibility. This is their order, table two. There's the salmon with the avocado mousse. The avocado mousse has been made to order so that it doesn't lose any colour. And the ceviche has to be marinated for a certain time. So all that has been organised by the chef de party. The guy, the chef, who's in charge of this particular section of the kitchen. It's been checked. It's ready to go. Before Escoffier, restaurants offered no choice. You ate what the chef was making. But with the a la carte menu... Escoffier introduced a level of complexity that required the culinary version of a production line. That's the starters gone. In about 15, 20 minutes, when they've finished, they're going to ask for the main course. One hake, one beef. And that's going to have to come up on the pass on exactly the same time so that it's hot and dressed perfectly for the customer. Imagine the chaos in here if they didn't have a brigade system. Two minutes on the beef. Two minutes on the fish, please. It's an army of experts, broken down into teams to produce really complex food. Yeah, now, yeah, Ollie. Fish coming out. That's exquisite. It's the kind of food you can get in a brigade system. It's not pub or home cooking. This is boat cuisine. Very The 
pleasure of eating out for the customer is not having to think about any of this. But as restaurateurs, our reputations are lost if we fail to live up to expectations. So we have to get it right. Every element, on every plate, on every table, every time. And that's the promise that we make. Moving into our front of house, now we're looking at positions in the restaurant itself. So in the dining room, we have a brigade system as well, so that we have the right people leading and uh, working and understanding exactly what they need to be doing. So the dining room manager, also known as the maitre d' or the maitre d'hotel, um, this person leads the dining room brigade. They train all the service personnel, they oversee wine selections, they develop the menu with the chef, and they also organize the seating chart where they're actually going to be placing all of the uh, all of the diners in the restaurant and they also assist with seating guests and greeting them and settling them all in a wine steward um, is an individual who's all about wine service uh, this individual purchases the wines because they understand which types of wines are most popular and which kinds of wines are the most up-to-date types of wines that are going to be uh, appreciated with the type of menu that you have this person assists guests with selecting the wines as well, and they serve the wines. Then we have the head waiter. This person is uh, is all about service throughout the entire dining room um, or that section of a dining room, making sure that all of the service team is where they need to be. A captain is an individual that would explain the menu to the guests. They take the orders, and then uh, they also do tableside preparations as well. The front waiter, this is an individual that um, the tables are going to be set properly for each course, making sure that there's the correct silverware for each course, making sure that all of the side dishes are all prepared, and then takes the food orders and delivers them to the correct tables. They, uh, they have the needs and taking care of the needs of the guests at every stage throughout their meal. The back waiter clears the plates and disposes of any uh, any leftover items and they refill things like water and basic beverages and then any other general small tasks that need to be taken care of there are many styles of restaurants and different styles of customer service organizations in traditional full service restaurants there is usually a formal service organization Basically, a group of workers that perform service-related tasks that fit together for the common goal of making sure guests enjoy themselves. A formal service structure usually begins with the maitre d' hotel, who is responsible for the overall management of service. Next, the head waiter is responsible for the service in a specific area, such as a banquet room or dining room. The captain is accountable for a server area of about 15 to 25 guests and the front waiter assists the captain. The front waiter usually has less experience than the other positions, one to two years. Finally, an apprentice is a server in training. In less formal structures, the organization might change. In today's contemporary full service restaurant, many operations follow a modified service structure. Compared to a formal service, positions are combined and the titles may be different. For example, the floor manager oversees the dining room and manages the front of the house staff. He or she may assist with the flow of guests and food in the event of a shortage or an unusually busy time at the restaurant. The hosts greet guests and are an important contact as they are the first people they will interact with at the operation. In addition, they maintain the flow in the restaurant by seating and regulating the number and frequency of people being seated. Basically, hosts make sure the waitstaff have an even flow of guests, so guests get properly served. Waitstaff are the primary servers for the restaurant. Their role is to ensure guests are served everything they order in a timely manner. Waitstaff have many responsibilities that in formal service are handled by several people. And finally, the role of busser, dining room attendant, or runner may be combined into one role or split up depending on the restaurant's organization. 
This position serves to assist the waitstaff in both serving and clearing tables. No matter how the operation organizes the service structure, it is important to know your role, assigned tasks, and responsibility as part of the team. Now we're going to move on to another basic in the kitchen, and this is something you've heard pretty much from day one, mise en place. So this is how we get ready to work, so that we're planned and we're prepared. So mise en place is French, to put in place, having everything together, uh, ready for you to be able to start preparing and cooking whatever it is that you're doing. So this is when we're doing preparation and assembly of ingredients, the pans, the pots, the various different equipment, the utensils and the serving pieces that we're going to need for that entire operation. So it's all about the preparation of the dish, set up before, and then cleaning whilst you're actually preparing. So mise en place um, solves two problems. It helps us to plan and prepare before service so that everything can run smoothly. So you're not running around uh, looking for different ingredients, different things, and doing preparation work during service when it's ultra important that you are ready and you are just working on serving and sending food out to the customers. The food items also uh, are made at the proper time as well, because if we, as we saw in the video about Escoffier's system that he, uh, that he invented, if you don't have all of the dishes coming up to the table at the same time, you're going to have unhappy customers. People have become uh, acquainted with expecting all of the food for that table to arrive at the same time with the quality and the heat and the taste being correct for every single thing. Mise en place demonstration. Mise en place is a French term meaning to put in place. It is more than just the steps in the recipe. It's a way to organize your time, tools, resources, and even yourself. Needs, as it is often shortened to in the professional kitchen, is everything. It refers to the preparation and assembly of ingredients, pans, utensils, equipment, and serving pieces needed for a particular dish. It includes not only the production of a dish, but also the setting up, breaking down, and cleaning while you work. It also includes making lists and detailed timelines to keep yourself and your means organized. Mies is all about setting up your station to have everything that you need. So think it through and get assembled. Prep in advance. There's no time to dice onions for a sauce when the restaurant is busy. Be safe, be smart, and work with a sense of urgency. The basic elements of mise en place include every item in your knife kit and every skill that you will learn. Mise is your body of knowledge and the art of applying it in the right time and place. Mise en place demonstration. So planning ahead is important when we're looking at various different dishes on our menu um, that we're going to have to create in our kitchen. So this is where we're identifying each ingredient and the equipment that we require. We want to write out a timeline so that we can assemble the workstation, the tools, the ingredients, everything that you're going to need to create that dish. And you perform it, um, advanced preparations as well. You balance the working, uh, you balance working quickly and, and the high quality of that food as well, because that's important. And then we always have a good clean station to work with and then figuring out any improvements that we can make too. Let's take a look at an actual timeline. This example is for a vegetable stir fry. So when we're looking at this, so we're gathering all our ingredients, we're doing our mise en place. So that's gonna involve about five minutes worth of work. And then we get to up to the 20th minute where we're preparing the rice um, and then keeping that warm. We're gonna wash the vegetables. It's only gonna take about three minutes, but then we're gonna cut those vegetables. It's gonna take us about 10 minutes. We're going to heat the oil in the pan to the appropriate temperature. It's going to take you a couple of minutes. We add another seven minutes on there 
to place the cut vegetables in the pan and saute them, continuously stirring them as well. So this means that in order to create this dish, it's going to take about 47 minutes of work to get there. Some of these things could be done simultaneously to cut down on the overall time, but the fact is, is that this timeline represents how, much, how many minutes of work it's going to entail. So in order to make this work for if we're in the restaurant, we need to figure out what things can be done before service as part of our mise en place, so that during service, we can cut this down to a reasonable length of time. So we have the steps of pre-preparation are important so that we can assemble our tools, assemble our ingredients, wash, trim, cut, prepare, and measure our ingredients, and prepare our equipment as well. The elements of mise en place include knife cuts, flavorings, herbs and spices, and basic preparations. These are the building blocks that a chef goes through when they're training, and this is something that is essential throughout a career of a, of a professional chef. Let's take a look at seasonings. So seasoning en enhances the flavor of the food. It doesn't change the flavor of the dish. So we should prevent overuse to make sure that it doesn't damage the flavors of that dish. So we generally will be adding these towards the beginning of our cooking because this way it can create depth of flavor. So some seasonings that we use. So we, this includes salts. So this can include kosher, iodized table salt, pink Himalayan salt, sea salt, rock salt, coarse grinding salt, and black salt. Different types of pepper. We have black pepper, white pepper, pink peppercorns, red pepper flakes, green peppercorns, and then telly cherry pepper. So different types of sugar. This can include things like granulated, powdered, brown sugar, sugar in the raw, sanding sugar, honey, molasses, dextrose, sucrose, and lactose. And then we have different acids. Uh, these can include things like citric acid. It might be lemon juice, orange juice, lime juice, wine, vinegars, and lactic acid. What is a flavor? So a flavor is the way that a food tastes. So when we're adding flavorings to a food, this is going to enhance the base ingredients. This is actually going to bring another flavor to the product. This is how it differs from seasoning, which just enhances the flavor of the foods, this is actually going to bring another flavor to the actual product itself. Flavorings that change the taste of original foods can include things like herbs, spices, extracts, fruits and vegetables, and aromatic liquids and cured foods. These enhance and add flavors um, and that includes herbs, which are leaves and stems of flowers or aromatic plants. And then spices, which are the bark, the roots, the seeds, the buds, or the berries um, of the aromatic plants. They can be used together, um, and new and exciting flavor combinations can be created by playing around with these. There are some traditional items, though, that work well. Herbs and spices are important ingredients used to enhance and add to the flavor of food. Herbs are the leaves, stems, or flowers of an aromatic plant. Spices are the bark, roots, seeds, buds, or berries of an aromatic plant. Each herb or spice used in a recipe contributes its own distinct flavor to a finished dish, and several can be used together to create new and exciting flavor combinations. Herbs and spices should be stored properly to keep them fresh and flavorful. Heat, light, and air all speed the loss of flavor and color, so optimal storage areas would be cool, dark, and away from air ducts. Next, I'd like to talk about fresh herbs. Herbs are a great ingredient to add to your dishes. They'll add additional flavor, as well as a little bit of a vibrancy and color to finish off your dishes. So when we discuss herbs, there's two different categories of herbs. Resinous herbs and fien herbs. Resinous herbs are going to be those herbs that are a little bit tougher in texture and characteristics. I always remember the difference between the two because the resinous herb is going to have almost a more tree-like stem to it, or more stalk-like stem. Rosemary is a great example to show that stem. 
I want to make sure that I'm pulling the leaves directly off the stem and I'm not serving this stem in my dish. Great examples of your resinous herbs, oregano, thyme, rosemary, and bay leaf all fall into this category. Oregano, rosemary, and thyme, the leaves need to be taken off the stems and they should be minced, that way they can be evenly incorporated into the dish. With your bay leaf, with bay leaves are fun, you will drop the entire bay leaf into the dish. So if you were to make a soup or a sauce to add a little bit of flavor, bay leaf is great. You do need to remember that the bay leaf does need to be removed though before we serve that dish to a customer. Your fien herbs. Fien herbs are going to have less of that stocky stem that your resinous herbs have. They're going to be a little bit greener on the stem and a little bit uh, easier to work with. Sage, dill, mint, basil, parsley, and cilantro are all great examples of your fien herbs. When working with many of these fien herbs, you still want to take the stems off from the leaves and work with just the leaves. Sage is wonderful whenever you're working with a lot of your meats, especially game meats such as turkey. Turkey and sage is a great combination to go together. Dill is a great way to freshen up many of your salads. Mint, it's a great addition to many of your desserts, but it can be used in savory cuisines as well. Your fresh basil works great with many of your Italian style cuisines. I have two different types of parsley here today. This is Italian style, also known as flat leaf parsley. And this is our curly parsley. Both can be used fairly interchangeably, even though the Italian parsley will have a little bit of a stronger taste to it. And then cilantro as well. Cilantro has a very distinct taste. It's used in a little bit more of a Latin American style of cuisine, but we use it in a very similar instance that we do with parsley. Finally, the last herb I have. This is known as lemongrass. Lemongrass looks like a stock vegetable, but we don't want to confuse it as a vegetable because it's more of an herb. With the lemongrass, we do peel the outer leaves away. And then what I will do is I will cut the end off here. And I want to stick with as much of this lemongrass stock down here as I can since this is where most of the flavor will be. I slice this, I can use the back of my knife to press out a little bit of the natural oils within this lemongrass, and then I use it to simmer and flavor many of our soups and sauces as well. When working with fresh herbs and when you're adding those to dishes, fresh herbs should be added as close to the end of cooking time as possible. That way, number one, we don't use, lose the beautiful color of the herbs, and secondly, so we don't lose too much flavor, you'll have a nice bright flavor in your dishes. Some common spices include cayenne, cinnamon, coriander, cumin, fennel, ginger, nutmeg, paprika, peppercorns, saffron, turmeric, and vanilla beans. With fresh herbs, um, you add the fresh herbs at the end of cooking to preserve that fresh flavor that you're, that you're adding in there. And you generally would use two to three times more than dried. With dried herbs, because they've been dried, uh, they're actually more concentrated in flavor because, of, uh, because they've had the, uh, the water content evaporated away, um, and so they're much, much stronger. So, and you generally will lightly crumble or grind those uh, to release the flavor as you're putting them into the food itself. Spices are generally um, harvested in their dried form when chefs get them. And so you can get them either whole or cut or ground. So when they're whole, you generally would add those um, early during the cooking process to allow the flavors to actually start coming out, uh, rehydrating and coming out into the food itself. Or if you're using cut or ground, you can actually find that some of those flavors can actually start to dissipate over time. Um, and so by toasting them, you can actually enhance the flavors of some of those and bring those flavors back out again.
Um, generally with cut or ground spices, you would actually add those later during the cooking process. We got to see quite a few of the different types of herbs um, on the video that we just saw, but let's flick through because uh, there may be a few that we can add into there as well. So we have basil, we have bay leaves and chives, cilantro, dill, and lavender. Sometimes people look at lavender as being more of a fragrant type of a thing, but there's a lot of flavor um, in lavender. Lemongrass, marjoram, mint leaves, oregano, parsley, and rosemary sage and savory, tarragon and thyme. Then with our spices, we have allspice, anise, capers, caraway, cardamom, cayenne, chili pepper, cinnamon and cloves, coriander, cumin and fennel, ginger, mace and mustard seeds, nutmeg, paprika, and peppercorns, poppy seeds, saffron, and star anise, sesame seeds, turmeric, and vanilla beans. Always make sure that when you're storing all the herbs and spices that they're done correctly so that that way we can keep all the flavor locked into them. So we must make sure that we keep them away from heat, light, and air. These, these actually speed up the loss of flavor in these things. So storing them in, in a tight glass jar is best. Have them in a covered cabinet, a drawer or a pantry, away from heat and light. Um, do not store them near stoves, dishwashers, sinks or air ducts. It may be convenient to have it right next to your stove, but the fact is unless if you're using that up in a short period of time, a lot of that product is going to spoil. Be careful when you add herbs and spices to foods. Some of them can be extremely dominant and overpower certain dishes. Always be careful of things like rosemary, cinnamon, cardamom, and paprika. They can be very, uh, very strong and can uh, actually knock out the flavor of the foods that you're looking to enhance. Make sure that you build layers of flavor so that, that way you have more complex flavored dishes. People will appreciate this. You can add these at different various stages of cooking to actually um, to actually draw out more or to blend in some of those flavors as well. And then we always check our seasoning. We're always going to adjust our seasoning as the final step. So refining certain ingredients for preparation uh, can include things like clarifying butter, setting up a warm uh, water bath to cook in, separating eggs, whipping egg whites, and then parchment paper liners, and then using your mise en place. How to clarify butter. First, place several pounds of butter into a stock pot and position it over a low flame on the range. Over very low heat, melt the butter completely without stirring it. As the butter melts, it will separate into three layers. Water and milk solids sink to the bottom. Clarified butter, the bright golden liquid, is in the middle, and foam is on the top. To get to the clarified butter, remove the foam from the top. Use a ladle or spoon to gently skim away the white foam. Next, carefully ladle the clarified butter layer into a container. The milk fat on the bottom should be the only thing remaining and it can be discarded. Now, the clarified butter is ready to become the liquid gold that many dishes need. How to clarify butter. Setting up a water bath can be essential for certain items. Uh, certainly if you're looking to make some cheesecake or if you're making some creme brulees or creme caramels, these need to have a water bath. This gives you the ability to gently cook baked goods in the oven. The oven heat absorbed is absorbed by the water, and so it's gently transferred to the product, so you're not overcooking it with too high of a heat. This is important for things like creme brulees and creme caramels, uh, where you don't want them to split from the egg product that's in there. It gives a good uniform heating process to the whole thing, and it prevents those hot spots from occurring. This is a great example over here where you can see uh, the actual uh, tin with the cheesecake is set up in there. 
And then right around the outside, this is the water which has been placed into here before you place it into the oven. Make sure that this water pan, if you're using especially if it's a spring form pan, make sure that that is watertight. If it's not, then you can line the outside of it with some uh, aluminum foil to make sure that no water seeps in to ruin that cheesecake. Place, an appro uh, place, it, in, uh, place it in the appropriate size hotel pan and then add enough water, about two thirds of the side of the item's pan, um, so that that way it doesn't uh, accidentally spill into the cheesecake itself. Um, and you want to have a two inch space on either side um, of, of this pan at least, just to make sure that you have good water flow and heat flow all the way around here. And then place that hotel pan into the oven. The best way to do it is by pouring that water in while it's actually in the oven. So that, that way you're not going to overfill it and also you're not going to spill it on the way to the oven as well. Make sure you check the water level um, as needed because you may have to top it off um, if that uh, item is being cooked for a significant length of time. Always be very careful removing it from the oven itself. That can be one of the most treacherous parts. Hi, I'm Marc Bauer from the French Curie Institute. I'm going to show you how to separate eggs. That means I'm going to separate the whites from the yolk. First, I crack the egg on a side of a bowl or on a cutting board and I separate with my thumbs into two shells. Of course, I have a bowl below and the egg white falls into it. Go back and forth until everything is separated. In case you get an eggshell, either in the white or the yolk, you can separate it with a spoon, or we can let them sit for a while, especially in the egg white, and the shell will fall to the bottom. Just make sure you don't pour it into the final product. That's how you separate eggs. Once you have your eggs separated out, another item that's good to know how to do is whipping your egg whites. So make sure you always have a very, very clean mixing bowl and whisk. You cannot have any oil residue in there. Otherwise, the eggs just will not whip up. And whip them at a moderate speed. And when they're foamy, increase that speed. Whip to the appropriate stage and then do not overbeat the eggs. Otherwise, overbeaten uh, eggs tend to have a dry surface. If you see right here, these have been overbeaten. Where they, where they start to have this dry kind of appearance. So you have a mixture here. You have soft peak, where they're droopy, rounded peaks. You have medium peak, which is a moist surface with rounded, stable peaks. And then you have stiff or firm peaks, uh, which is where they, uh, they actually are stable and they hold uh, their shape. And they're moist and glossy. Here's a good example of how we can use some of those phoned up eggs.
Another great skill to be able to have is to be able to make a parchment liner for a round pan. So as you can see in this uh, well illustrated piece up here, so you cut a larger piece than the diameter of the pan, and then you fold it in half to form a triangle. Continue to half that triangle each time. And then what you do, you place the, the narrow end right in the center of that bowl so that you can actually measure that this is right to where I need to be able to cut. And then you cut that, and then you can actually lay it straight out in there. This is great to be able to use, especially if you're making cakes. It helps you to release those cakes very, very successfully. The other place where you can use this type of, uh, of a liner is actually to make a cartouche that you place over the top of any sauces. If you have a pot of, say, bechamel sauce or a Mornay sauce, and you don't want it to skin over on top, you can actually make a cartouche like this. You would actually make it slightly larger than the actual size of the pan so that it would come up just up the sides of the pan just slightly and you place it actually on the surface of the liquid of that sauce. This will stop it from forming a skin. How to peel and dice an onion. First, hold your guiding hand on top of the onion between the tip and root ends. Take your chef's knife and point the tip of the blade toward the middle of the root end. Slice down vertically, connecting the tip and root end in a straight line. Try to keep the root end attached to keep the onion layers together. Then, peel the outside layer of the onion on each half. Next, Hold the onion half with your guiding hand on top. Your first cut will begin about a quarter of an inch from the bottom of the onion. Then, move the knife gently backward and forward in a horizontal sawing motion. Stop cutting about a quarter of an inch from the root end. Rotate the onion half so that the attached root end points toward the top of the cutting board. Insert the tip of your blade near the root and pull down. These are vertical cuts that follow the natural lines of the onion. Rotate the onion back to the original position with the root end pointing away from your knife. In a fluid motion, bring the blade down on top of the onion. How to peel and dice an onion. And now on to nutritional labels. So a nutritional label has all of the nutritional facts on there, information on what that dish contains. So it helps people to avoid food allergens, it helps them to plan for special diets, and to understand the nutritional amounts that are actually in that food. So when we take a look at our, uh, at our nutritional facts label, it actually gives nutrients um, that are reported as a percentage of what your recommended daily amount or the recommended daily value is and so this is listed right down here it is based on a 2000 calorie diet so the labels actually contain uh, the nutrient content that's required and these are actually listed in the order that represents the priority of dietary recommendations by the US government the serving size and the servings per container are also listed in there. The serving size is the basis for reporting each food's nutritional content and also the amount of food that's eaten at one time by their recommendation. The servings per container show uh, how many servings are within that package itself. And the size influences the calories and the nutritional um, amounts as well. The total calories um, show the amount of one serving, and also the total fat and saturated fat is listed, showing the total grams of fat in one serving and the total grams of saturated fat in one serving. The trans fats are also listed on there, show the total grams of trans fatty acids or trans fats in one serving. Uh, trans fats have a very negative effect um, on our cholesterol, on our heart. They're very, very bad for our health. Cholesterol is actually shown as a percentage of the daily value. Um, it should be up to about 300 milligrams. Sodium, as a percentage of the daily value, should be no more than 2,400 milligrams. Um, that's sodium and chloride. So let's take a look 
and exactly the recommendations that they have here showing the actual amounts which uh, which uh, which work in together so a quarter teaspoon of salt so not very much salt is actually 575 milligrams of sodium half a teaspoon of salt is 1150 milligrams of sodium so you can see as you build up here one teaspoon of salt being 2300 milligrams is a significant amount of sodium and that's just one teaspoon a lot of salt in our diet is actually hidden um, in the foods that we eat, uh, especially if you eat any fast foods, uh, they generally tend to have significant amounts of sodium already in them. One teaspoon of baking soda has about 1,000 milligrams of sodium. When we're looking at carbohydrates, this includes carbohydrates, dietary fiber, and sugars. So dietary fiber and sugar is the food's total carbohydrate, carbohydrate content. The percentage of fiber as, as shown on um, on the list would actually show that a daily recommendation of about 25 grams is recommended. Um, this can actually help us to decrease our cholesterol and it also helps to aid in digestion and to keep us regular. We can't actually digest the dietary fiber but it helps to keep things moving through our digestive tract. Protein is shown in total grams in one serving and then other types of uh, micronutrients like vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium are also listed on there. People usually don't get enough of a lot of these specific items. Um, they're actually at higher risk of chronic health problems when they don't. Hopefully you learned a lot from these items. Kitchen Basics really does cover a very wide variety of different things. Um, and hopefully you were able to pick up on a lot of these things. If you need to go back around and take another look, then please do, because there's a lot of details in here, ranging from the way that we prepare foods, the way we prepare to prepare foods, and also the areas of the kitchen um, that take care of these different foods as well. I look forward to seeing you in the kitchen soon. Cheers.